Woohoo! Yay! Oh my gosh! Is it finally over? Why are you wearing that ridiculous hat? It's party time, man. You can't keep your hat on anyways. I know. My gosh, it's I got my goggles. This on. is it. Is we're it done. Last this is the last podcast one. of the year. Woohoo! So we're going to uh, talk about uh, actually kind of a serious topic though. It's kind of kind of a downer. Nuclear chemistry. Oh. Uh, yeah, and all the energies and stuff like that. And like we're gonna finish you know, what we start with we finished the whole year with? How to build a bomb? Yeah, how to build a nuclear yeah, bomb. So it's sure. just really this really exciting topic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> how to build a nuclear bomb. Now don't any of you go out and build a nuclear bomb. If you go out and build a nuclear bomb, I'll get really mad at you. Okay. And Mr. Sams, he'll come get you. Yeah. You know, uh, if he's still alive. So. <laughs> okay. So But today, we do need to talk about the science behind it. Yeah, the science behind it. Actually we won't give you enough information to actually build a nuclear bomb. That's good. Yeah. Because in case this gets out on the internet, which it probably will. So <laughs> we'll talk all right, let's do it. Okay, so today what we want to do is do nuclear reactions and so uh, balancing and the kinetics. So just real fast. Hey, uh, nuclear reactions, actually let's back up. Nuclear reactions are about what part of the atom we're going to study? The nucleus. And see, the nucleus can do various and sundry uh, different things. And what do you find in the nucleus, Mr. Sams? Protons and neutrons. So the protons and neutrons can like, uh, well... The thing that's interesting about the nucleus of the atom, you know, that's the center of the atom with its protons and its neutrons. Mm -hmm. It can undergo changes. Now, the reality is, is before today, the last podcast of the year, in this course, chemistry, we really have been really studying how electrons play a mm -hmm. role because there's, that's what how makes chemical reactions take place. Yeah. But in a nuclear reaction, the nucleus will do something. It will either split up or join, yep. basically, and that's the two options. Now, that leads us to kind of an interesting diagram. Um, this is the uh, nuclear stability diagram. Now let's kind of talk about so, a couple of things here. This is Z. Now what's Z stand for? Z is our number of protons. That's the protons. And N is the number of uh, neutrons. neutrons. And as it turns out, the higher, if you were to take a line, the early elements, so like hydrogen, yeah. hydrogen actually has one proton and zero neutrons. Mm -hmm. But if you take, say, helium, he's got two protons and two neutrons. So yeah. it's got a ratio of one to one. Yeah, those little elements like to be one to one. Nice and stable. But as you get higher and higher, so if we take, say, element 80 right here, the nucleus or the nuclei that are stable actually have more neutrons than they do protons. Right. And so Not they, too call, many more. they call that there the zone. Zin? Zone of stability. These are where you have stable nuclei. Now, um, and they're called actually a fancy word, they're called isotopes of yep. each other. We talked about isomers last time. Yeah. An isotope. Isopotes. Isotope. Man, I cannot spell today <laughs> for life like I ever could. Isotopes. What's an isotope? Uh, same number of protons, different number of neutrons. Yeah, and I think we'll talk about that. So, yeah. and I'd write it here. The same number of protons, but different number of neutrons. That little yeah. Everybody know what that means? This is neutrons. number. Neutrons. N-E-U-T-R-O-N-S. N-U-R-T-O-N-S. <laughs> wow. I'm having the last <laughs> podcast. I'm having difficulty. Not um, to mention this is the fourth one we've made in a row. Yeah, so. we're, uh, yeah. yeah, you notice our clothing. It's the same. Yeah. All right, so <laughs> in nuclear stability, there are actually several types of particles. And actually, if you're trying to understand this just for the AP test, you, this is it. If, you, if you understand this, you're good. What's an alpha particle? Alpha particle is actually just like a helium nucleus. It has two protons and two neutrons. It actually has a plus two charge on it as well. Technically, it has a plus yeah. two charge, but nuclear people don't care about the charges. No, nope, because they, they don't care, care about electrons. They don't care about electrons. Right. Technically, it has a plus two charge. So it's just two protons yep. and two neutrons yep. in the nucleus of... Yeah, now why'd you put that little four up there, Mr. Bergman? What is that? Oh, yeah, the four is the weight. This is the atomic uh, weight. Actually, a better weight thing would be the mass number. number. They're sort of the same. Actually, it's not really the same. Yeah. It's the mass number. And then number two right here is the number of protons. Atomic, the atomic number. number. Okay. So if we know the atomic number and we know the mass number, we can always find the neutrons by subtracting them. Yeah, four minus two, two. Yep. Okay. Now, a beta particle is actually an electron. It is. And it, it's we, a nuclear electron. This is the symbol for a beta particle, or sometimes we actually use the beta symbol, zero and negative one. Now, electrons have no weight nope. or no mass. They have a very they small do, but mass, but for this purposes, it's zero. And the charge is negative one of right. an electron. So that's how you write this. And sometimes you put an E, sometimes you put a B. And a positron is actually a positively charged electron. electron. I'll bet you didn't know that they exist. 
Yeah, and so these actually exist as well. So it's again it has no weight, but it's charged just positive. It's a positively charged and electron. And the cool thing is, if a positron meets an electron, meets an electron, they annihilate each other. It's called nuclear annihilation. It's it very ceases cool. to become ceases to be matter. It turns into energy. It turns into energy. Lots of energy. Yeah. There's also gamma particles. That's it's not similar. Really a particle. Why? It's yeah. Kind of a misnomer. Uh, a, probably a gamma ray. Is usually ray. Called. And actually, it's just zero zero. It's just energy. Yep. Yeah. A neutron is has a weight of one and there's no charge, so it's just one zero with an n. That's yep. pretty easy. Hyde, a, a proton is a one one p, or sometimes it's just a one one h. Because if you think about it for a moment, a hydrogen atom has one proton, no neutrons, no, and actually technically it's got a positive charge. Yep. But we don't care about that. Proton is just that's so that. So yeah. Yeah. It's one one. So you, it's important if you just memorize. This would be great stuff for um, like note cards at the end of the year. You just need to write down and memorize all these different particles. And once you know the particles, everything is hinky dory. Yep. All right. Now when they decay, there's uh, different kinds of uh, radioactive. Uh, Activity, and there's what we call radioactive decay. There's beta particle production, positron production, electron cap capture, alpha particle production, gamma ray production, and spontaneous fission. All right, so we'll just do some examples. Okay, now what is beta particle production? Okay. Actually, let's actually take a reaction. Let's take the one they've got here. Yeah. Actinium 227.89. I lost my pen. Actinium 227.89. What was that number? 89. 89. And it makes a beta particle. That's right. a zero, negative one. Put an E there. And the other thing that it makes, actually, we haven't really talked about this, but when you balance a nuclear reaction, yeah. you don't balance it in the way we've balanced other you equations. You make the numbers add up. So this is 227, and this needs to be over here. The chemical you're missing needs to have uh, 227, because 227 plus zero is 227. Mm -hmm. And then 89. I need to have this side add up to 89. So yep. 89 plus what? Negative 1 plus what is 89? 90. It'd be 90. And then I look on my periodic table and I find element number 90, and that 90 is, is the th. Th. Now, it didn't change its weight, but it went up in its charge. How's it? What's up? Or it's uh, in its atomic number? Uh, yeah. The, the weird thing is, we didn't really add any protons. What we did is we turned a neutron into a proton. Yeah. See, it turned into this. Plus zero, negative right. one. So what yeah. happened is one of those neutrons kicked out an Split electron up. from itself yeah. and turned into a, pro a proton. So you probably didn't know this, but a, a neutron is actually made up of a proton and an electron. In fact, neutrons have a slightly higher mass than do a proton because they the mass have an electron. It's not really like they have an electron in it. It's not like it's like no, a shell. It's not a sort of separate somehow. entity. It's but when it breaks apart, it breaks apart the neutron. Yeah. It breaks apart into a proton yep. and an electron. Now the so, opposite can also happen. It's yes. called electron capture. Yes. So it can go both directions. Yeah. All right. Actually, let's learn how to balance those reactions. All we already right. talked about it. Tops so have to easy. add up. So easy. Bottoms have to it's add up. Easy thing you'll do all year. Six plus two is uh, mm -hmm. eight. Eight. Uh, four plus so I think four. it'd be four. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is three plus one is a uh, four, four. So two plus a uh, two. two. Now, by the way, now we have to uh, get a periodic table. Yep. So it's four two. Let's look at a periodic table. Element number two on the periodic table would be uh, a helium, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. So then you write helium. The end. That's it, done. Now this next one? Oh, you know what we didn't do? We didn't put the numbers. That's why. No. That's okay, though. Strontium 88. 38. So if I find strontium, strontium right here is right here, 38. So I have to put the other number here. Krypton 36. is a noble gas. So that's 36. 36. And PD is what, Mr. Sam? PD, PD, 46. 46. So this is 46. So if we add 88 and 84, we get 172. 172. And so th this adds up to 172, but I've already got 116 yep. right here. So what's 56. The, this will be 56. And this will be 38 and 36, 60, 74. That's uh, 74. And then minus, minus 46, 46 28. 28. So now I'm going to look on my periodic table, find element number 28. And guess what the other chemical is? Nickel. Nickel. It's the nickel, the nickel, nickel. Nickel no so. All right. Calcium is element 20. I happen to know that from my head. Mm -hmm. Californium, CM, is down here somewhere. 96. All right. I'm going too fast. Pause me, okay? And then SM. All right. I don't know what it is. Samarium, I believe. I think you're right. I don't know where Samarium is. Oh, there. It's element 62. 
So the tops add up to 288, right? Yep. So 288 minus 147 141. is 141. And then uh, 116, did I do that right? Yep. Minus 62 uh, 54. is 54. So we go look on our periodic table, find element 54, xenon. and it's a xenon. See, you're just adding them up, guys. All right, now this one's a little tricky. Um, calcium is still element 20, and uranium is element 92. I just looked on my periodic table. Actually, I knew it in my head. And then zinc is 30. 30. Now, the top of the, of the left side adds up to 278, yep. right? But we're going to subtract what? 70 and 4. We have 4 neutrons kicking out, so minus this adds up to 74, so that's 204? Yep. But this lead. Uh, 92, 112. This adds up to 112 down here. Mm -hmm. Minus 30. It's 92, isn't it? 82. 82. It's lead still. Yep. Yeah. So that's the answer. This, folks, um, expect this on the multiple choice portion of the AP exam. You will see it, and they will give you one of these. Yep. It's easy. It just make sure the top adds and the bottom adds, and yeah. then use your predict table, which you'll have. Yeah. It's as simple as that. Yep. All right. Oh, yeah, we should just do some yeah, sample ones do, like this. Yeah. So if I have uh, iridium-174, so if I find iridium, iridium is IR if I'm not mistaken. Iridium, actually, not, as a side note, let me write this down. IR was 74? 77. 77? Yep. When I write 174, does that, what does that mean? That's its mass number. So that's its mass number, which is 174. And if it goes via alpha particle decay, you have memorized those charts yep. there. So that's a 4-2 alpha, you could also put an HE right there, and then we make them add up, but yep. see, you just need to know what this particle is, so you know it breaks into a 4, 2, and plus whatever, that'd be 170, and you lose 2, it'd be 75, yep. so R -E. 75 is RE, found that from the periodic table. Now if I decay a beta particle, well platinum is PT, his number is 199, and his or his mass number, his atomic number Mr. 78. is 78, if he's going to do the beta particle thing, that's going to make a 0, a negative one beta plus that'll be 199 and then it'll go up that's that one where it goes up one yep and 79 and that's gold gold up. hey Ooh, we just made gold we turned that the, the alchemist's dream yeah right we there. turned platinum into gold the only problem of course is platinum platinum's more expensive than gold it's more expensive than gold ah up. darn it positron emission all right so this is going to be <laughs> sulfur s31 now sulfur's number is like 12? uh 16 16 too far. 16. He's going to make a positron, so that's a 0, 1, E. So I just know my particles, right? Mm -hmm. From that other uh, chart, that'll be 31 and um, 15. 15. Element 15 P. is phosphorus. I don't need this line here. That's a mistake. All right. An electron capture for krypton. I'll do that up here. Krypton 76. That's krypton 36. is 36. Got a and capture it's a capture an electron. electron. So it's a, a zero, beta negative one, e. So that's going to be seventy-six and uh, thirty-five, right? It is, yeah. And thirty-five is bromine. So that's the answer. This is easy, guys. Yeah. Just so so easy. Yeah. All right. Now let's uranium also uranium does this mess. Now we also have some oddness in uh, if you take a uranium two thirty-eight molecule atom, whatever. Mm -hmm. Actually, isotope would be the term. Yeah. It actually undergoes an alpha particle decay, and then a beta particle decay, and then another beta particle decay, and then an alpha, and then a beta, and then an alpha, and then a beta, beta, beta particle. And eventually it turns into lead over like uh, a billion years or something. So it's a very, very long period of time. But you can actually, um, well, let's just do one of those. You want to do all of them? Not really, because you can't yeah. really see it. You kinda, we, I think we've you gone through it. You, yeah, you, you get, get the picture. All right. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So we're going to skip that. All right, now, 18.2, though, um, second to last thing of the, yeah. of the year. Kinetics. Guys, remember kinetics? You remember? Yeah. And it basically, it follows what we call first-order kinetics. Remember, you, yeah. you used to write um, the natural log of A equals negative KT plus the natural log of A0. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? That's the same thing that applies here. Yep. Actually, the equations are slightly rewritten. Yeah, it's the same thing. It's just... Yeah, but now we're going to use, instead of, when we have radioactive things decay, we're going to use oh. an N. Now the N stands for the number of nuclei. Yeah. But it also it is proportional to the mass yeah. of the object. Mm -hmm. So you can actually use mass. So it can be the number of nuclei or the mass. The N0 is the original amount, and the N is the amount at some time T. 
Yes. And the um, half-life is just this 0.693 over k. We've seen this before. And the rate equals k. And we used to write rate equals k, and we still will for times a to the x power, right, or whatever. But this is first order, so it would always be to the first power. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's take let's a look go. at some examples. Yeah. Math is easy. All right, tectinium-99 used to form pictures of internal organs in the body mm. um, to excess heart damage. Hopefully this is not a problem we're going to have. All right, the rate constant. For, My dad had that done. Oh, yeah. You did? did they use tectinium? Uh, I would imagine. Yeah. That's the radioactive dye they stuck in the So arms. the rate constant is this. So this is what? This is equal to K. That's your K. What's the half-life? Well, remember the half-life equation, T1 half, equals 0.693 over k. So in this case, that'll be 0 0.693 over 1.16 times 10 to the minus 1. So what do you get, Mr. Well, Simmons? it helps to have your calculator actually turned on when you put the when you're punching numbers in. Yeah. Yeah, it took me a minute. Okay, there we go. 5.97 hours it would be. Because the unit for k was hours. Yeah. Hours to the minus 1. Hours to the minus 1, right. Okay, so um, now this one's a little different because it's going to say how much. So the half-life, they gave us the half-life, mm -hmm. and we started with a 1 milligram sample mm -hmm. after 335 hours. So we're going to use this equation, the natural log of n over n0 is equal to negative kt. Because I have a time, 67 hours. Mm -hmm. That's the half-life. That's half -life. the half-life. We're going to have to use that to find k. And 335 is my time. Yep. So this is equal to t, but I need to find k. Now n0 is, this is n0. Yeah. All right, so let's find k. So k will be equal to 0 0.693 over the half-life. So that'll be 0 0.693 divided by 67. You get a pretty tiny number there. Uh, 0 0.0103. So I'm just going to say the natural log of x over 1 x is my n, because I want to set this up. And the 1 soul. is from the 1.000 yeah, milligram. This is the 1 is from this. If this number is 72, you put mm -hmm. 72, is equal to negative 0 0.0103 times 335. You can put it in your solver or not. But this one you probably wouldn't need to, really. Yeah. And so you get um, 0. Point, so n is equal to 0. Point 0, 3, 0, 3, 2 milligrams. So after 335 hours, you have 0 0.032 milligrams. Yeah. Now let me say something too on this. Um, if you get the AP exam, um, and you get a multiple choice question like this, the interesting thing that they will do is they will almost always give you a even number of half-lives. Does that make yes. sense? And so hopefully I have a problem like that. If not, we're going to make one up. Yeah, All I right. think there is one in here. I think so. All right. Let's do another one. Woodcraft from a Chinese temple has a carbon-14 activity of 24.9 counts per minute as compared to 32 at standard 0H. Yeah, now you said that the number of nuclei was proportional to the mass, but it's also proportional to, to the, the activity of, uh, in yeah. a Geiger counter. So basically this is N, uh -huh. and this is N0. Zero. Zero. And I think we're going to solve for time. Uh, yeah, because it wants to know. Yeah, half-life. Yeah, some old temple thing. We have to determine the age. How old is it? Yep. So we're using the same equation. We're going to use um, the natural log of n over n0 is equal to negative kt. So we're going to just solve for t now. So the natural log of n, n today is 24.9. Mm. n a long time ago was 32.5. I never have figured out how they knew that, by the way. How do they know that? Um, 5,000 years ago, they didn't have a Geiger counter. I don't know. There's somehow that these guys No, it's this. based on what the activity of, of a living organism would be today versus something that had has died and then is no longer going through that. Oh. It's no longer replenishing the carbon with the carbon dioxide from the oh, air. I knew that. Okay, yeah. something like that. All right, and K, oh, we got to do K. K is going to be the uh, 0.693 divided by the half-life, which they said was 5,715 years. So this will be a pretty tiny number. 5, 1.2 times 10 to the negative 4. Solve for t. So what does this term here, Mr. Sams? We'll work it out. What um, is this term here equal to? The which? log term. Oh, uh, 0. 0.766. 0. 0.766 would be equal oh, to... Oh, sorry, log of 0. 0.766, which is negative 0. 0.266. So negative 0. 0.266 would be equal to 
negative 1.2 times 10 to the minus fourth times t. Divide both sides by 1 point, negative actually, 1.2 times 10 to the minus fourth. Yep. Negative 1.2 times 10 to the minus fourth, and you get t to be what? Uh, 2220. Two, 2220, and that's years. That's years from ago from present. Right. Yeah, so this that's piece of wood, yeah. when that wood died, Yep. Uh, not necessarily when they made the artifact. Right. It was 2,220 years ago. Yep. Okay. All right. We should probably do one of those half-life, even half-life problems. Don't you yeah. Think, Mr. Sears? Yeah. So this would be a sample question. This actually tends to appear in the multiple choice section of yeah. the AP exam. Now, a lot of you would think, oh, I've got to do you know natural log of n over n0. Mm, and yeah. it would work. Yeah. But the good news about this one is that we have 8 days and we have 32 days for half-lives. Yeah. So if I start with 100 gram sample, I, I like to do it like in a chart. Mm -hmm. This is the mass, and this is the time. So at 100 gram sample, that time would be zero. a day 0. Right. right. And then if I go to... Eight days. Eight days. That's one half life. One half life. Days. Of course, there will be fifty, 50. grams. And if then I go to uh, sixteen days, I keep adding. That's eight, two half lives. That will be yeah. twenty-five grams. Mm -hmm. And if I then go to twenty-four, there will be half of this again, right. twelve point five lives. grams. You just yep. keep cutting in half. Mm -hmm. And at thirty-two, there would be half of that would be six and a quarter, yep. right? There it is. So that's it's four half lives from the original. So you just cut it in half four times. Yeah, you might just say, oh, thirty-two divided by eight. That's four. Um, and then you figure out it's the fourth half-life, one, two, three, four. Watch that. You do have a zero half-life, too, so you don't want right. to get the third one when you should have the right. fourth one. And that will be one of the choices, a guarantee. Yeah, yes, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So watch that. It's tr tricky, but if it's a multiple choice question with half-lives, just make a little chart, and boom, you're going to have this answer in, well, what, about a minute, probably. Or less. Or less, yeah. Okay, how do we use radioactivity? What's the point? Uh, what do we use? What do we, how, what do we use to detect it? Well, do we detect it with the Geiger counter. And that just detects the alpha particles or the beta particles that are coming off of a decomposing Yeah, so uh, we have these devices that can measure uh, reactivity. You might have seen the movies yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. They tick, 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 tick. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, there's a number of four, th I got four things that, that we use electro, uh, we use nuclear stuff for. <laughs> we use it for old things. Yep. Well, just the example we just did. Yeah, the carbon-14 dating. Um, yep. You can uh, date an old artifact uh, from, you know, and say this was, you know, the wood died. 5,000 years ago or 2,000 mm -hmm. years ago or whatever it might be. Also, there's some medical uses um, uh, for radioactivity. Yep. So um, like uh, radioactive dyes for, like we were talking about earlier, detecting heart blockage. So yeah. when my dad went in to get his heart checked out, they injected him with this dye and then they hooked him up to an x-ray machine. They could see where that dye stopped in his heart. There was some blockage there and yeah. they had to go in now, and But why it would they use radioactivity? Why didn't they? I mean, why 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 do they use that? It sounds kind of dangerous to put radioactive stuff in someone's it body. It does, but it provides contrast between your non-radioactive parts that are in yeah. there. And Actually, then they yeah. use things with really short half lives too, so it's decomposed and out of your body within a few days. Yeah. One thing also that's that's very cool about uh, radioactive things is they can be tech detected in infinitesimally small amounts mm -hmm. with. Uh, Geiger counters. Now, some of those Geiger counters are pointed at somebody's body, essentially. Not exactly a Geiger counter, but basically it's, it's a detector, a detector of, some sort, of yeah. some sort. It can be detected uh, at such, such, such small amounts. So that's something that's very cool about it. And then they can find blockages. When my mom was really sick, she had cancer, and she had uh, they, they gave her some barium treatments to discover where some blockages were in her intestinal system. Oh, oh I've Since, had that and, before, actually. Oh. I had to drink the barium milkshake. Yeah, the barium milkshake, oh, and they take pictures yeah. as it goes down. And upper and, GI, well, not fun. Unfortunately, they, she had the reverse, the oh, lower GI. Yeah. yeah. Then okay. they put you on a table, so after you've drunk this nasty milkshake, they put you on a table and they rock you around in a bunch of different nasty. orientations. Oh. and. Oh. And you're, yeah, it's not pleasant. Energy. Energy is interesting, of course. Yeah. Um, uh, this is becoming a bigger issue. I, I just saw that uh, the nuclear energy industry just, uh, and uh, you may be watching this years later, but the nuclear energy industry is hiring tons of people in our down economy yeah. because um, um, a bunch of nuclear power plants are about to come on board so that you yep. can have uh, power plants. And then lastly, uh, they can be used, sadly, um, for weapons, and they're very, very destructive. Let's talk a little bit about a couple of these. Uh, yep. Nuclear energy. Basically, you have the nuclear reaction. This is a, a schematic of a nuclear power plant. These yep. are the things that are being built, a number of these. Mm -hmm. um, we could go into details of... Uh, it's somewhat controversial. But it makes steam. Basically, they take yeah. They have this reactor, That's the point. and they have the the nuclear chemicals. It actually does fission, yep. and um, what happens is it heats up a bunch of water. The water then pumps through. Um, 
goes out here and it pumps through um, another thing so that this this container right here never comes into contact with um, something that goes out in the world. Right. It then boils water. The water turns into steam. It then turns a steam turbine and you make electricity. Yep. They then cool that water, send it back. It's just this loop. you got like yep. several loops happening by the way, The exact same process is used in a coal-fired power plant, yes. but the source of the heat in a coal-fired power plant is burning coal. The source of the heat in a nuclear power plant is the nuclear reaction. One thing that's so nice about nuclear power is that you it's can use a very – well, that's true. <laughs> but it's also you can use a very, very small amount of material right. to get a very large amount of energy. Yeah. So the only problem with nuclear power is you've got a waste product when you're done that you have to do something with. But it's a very, very small amount of waste product. That's and there's true. There's no uh, greenhouse gases. Exactly, no greenhouse gases. So, yeah, from a, from a greenhouse standpoint, it's very, very clean. So a lot of people really think nuclear power is, is a great opportunity or yeah. option for uh, uh, the world's power. Many other countries uh, than the United States use it um, almost exclusively for their uh, yeah. electricity. See, my brother and my dad are coal miners, so I can't, so you, I, I can't say I like nuclear power because uh, they'll get mad at me. But I actually, I, I think it's a very good idea. I think it's a really too. good idea, actually. <laughs> okay, um, now why do scientists get so excited about all this nuclear stuff? Because well, it's welcome. neat. No, it's because it's... Because it's the last podcast. No, it's because it's lots of energy. Oh, okay. Because if you think about it for a moment, this is actually the in interesting thing about nuclear. This okay. is what gets them kind of all jazzed up. If you were to take the mass of a proton, this right here is the mass of a proton. Yes, because it's... And this is the mass of a neutron. Yeah. But if you were to look at an oxygen atom and find out the mass of the nucleus of an oxygen atom, it would be eight of these. So let's actually do the math on this, Mr. Sanders. Okay. So if I take eight protons, so eight times 1.6726 times 10 to the minus 27th plus... Six two, I'm going to include that last digit in there. Six two. Yeah, you should do the whole thing. Actually, yeah. I, I did two six two, yeah. And then we took eight times... 1.67493 times 10 to the minus 27th. And we added those up, we would get what? Mr. Sam is busily on. typing, trying to figure out how to do this in his computer. Whoops, I just screwed something up. All right. Put the plus sign of the wrong spot in the parentheses. Ah! <laughs> in the all right, after much yeah. deliberation, Mr. Sam's that. actually <laughs> added it up. It is what, Mr. 2.67804 times 10 to the negative 26th. Now, I'm actually going to go back and double check my work, but I think that that's looks right. right. Now, this is the mass of eight protons and eight neutrons. But if you actually weigh an atomic, a nucleus of oxygen, guess what you get? 2.65. Less. Instead of 2.67. Wait a second. I thought if I take two things and I mix them together, and I, you know, like if you and I stood on a scale individually, yep. and then we stood on the scale together, yep. we would weigh the same the as sum, our, the sum, right? Exactly. But the interesting thing is when you take the protons and the neutrons and you add them together, they weigh more than the actual nucleus. So you, when this atom forms, it loses mass. Hmm. In fact, we have a name for that. It is called the mass defect. Everybody write mass, mass defect. There's a lost amount of mass. That lost amount of mass, we would actually, let's find, what is the lost amount of mass? If you subtract oh, exactly. these two numbers, 2 6, 7, 8, 7, 0, 4, minus 2.65535. So 2.65535. We get 2.3354. Times 10 to the negative 28. So you lose 2.3, whatever, times 10 to the minus 28 kilograms. What happens to that mass? Um, it, it deposits doesn't... itself on my love handles. No. Oh. It is converted to energy. All right. Oops. It's called the mass defect. All right. So we have, let's look at our number here. And actually, this utilizes an equation. This is a very famous equation. You might know oh, this. Yes. E equals mc squared. Einstein's important equation. So it's actually, as a side note, it's not actually E equals mc squared. It's E equals delta mc squared, the change in the mass. Oh. Our change in mass was 2. Point what? Uh, I don't remember. 2.33 times 10 to the minus 28. By the way, the m does have to be in kilograms. Yep times c is the speed of light, which is 3.0, times 10 to the 8th, 
meters per second. But you not only do you take that number, which is a big square. fast number, but you square it and you get how many? You get 2.10 times 10 to the negative 11th joules. I believe it's joules, yeah? Yeah, that's joules. That's now, joules per, per atom. atom. So if we were to have a mole of those atoms, you would times this by 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd yep. atoms in a mole. And you get 1.27 times 10 to the 13th joules. That's joules, and if we divide that by 1,000. Uh, 1.26 or 1.27 times 10 to the or times 10 to the 10th. And that's kilojoules. kilojoules. Now the reason that's I do this, that's per oxygen. mole. If you were to burn methane, this is natural gas mm -hmm. that we get out of the ground, it's 882 kilojoules per mole. How much more would you get out of this? Take this number, Mr. Sams, okay. and divide it by 882. I think it's about a million. 882, it's uh, 1.4 million. 3, 4, 5, 6, uh, it's 14 million. 14 million. Now what I want to say is that if I had one mole of oxygen that I could uh, smoosh together using nuclear chemistry, and I had one mole of methane, I would get 14 million times more energy out of the nuclear stuff per mole. Wow. That's a lot. So if you think of your coal mining family, no offense, <laughs> but if I had a ton of coal, uh -huh. 2,000 pounds of coal, I would need 14 million times less nuclear stuff to get the same amount of energy. Yep. So take a ton, divide it by 14 million, and you've got just a itsy bitsy little piece to get the same amount of energy. This gets scientists like going, like whoa, whoa that's just amazing. Energy is a huge problem in the world. You can get a lot of energy out of nuclear stuff. All right. Now, All right. when the nuclear is happening, there are two varieties of uh, processes that occur. One is called fission. What is fission? Uh, it has to do with fish. Like fish. Fish. Yeah, like where you go fly fishing. No, it does oh, not. Sorry. It is when large nuclei break up. Break up. So an example here would be uranium-235. This is actually the stuff that makes nuclear bombs. And it breaks apart actually after you add a neutron into um, two fission fragments and eventually turn into... Uh, yeah, we didn't explain, but two smaller nuclei. Yep. Those nuclei then produce a neutron. This is actually something else, but yeah. uh, but it is. It breaks apart into smaller nuclei. And then fusion is a little bit different. This is when small nuclei join. They fuse together. Or fuse together. This is what happens in the sun. Right, so we have deuterium, hydrogen, which is, weighs two, with, mixed with the tritium. They combine and they make a helium and they kick off a neutron. And also, they lose a little mass. And when they lose that little bit of mass, <laughs> lots and lots and lots of energy. All right, we're almost done. We are. How do you build a nuclear bomb? I don't know, but I bet you're gonna tell us. Yeah, nuclear bombs, sad to say. Um, a horrible thing that mankind has invented, no question. Um, lots of interesting history about the nuclear bomb. You ought to read about that someday. And the Manhattan Project and Einstein and Oppenheimer. Uh, Oppenheimer and the whole group. All right, yeah, back in the 1940s. Uh, first of all, there's this thing called a chain reaction. What's a chain reaction? A uh, reaction that causes another reaction to happen right after it. So, all right, so a chain reaction is a self-sustaining fission process. Now, if you have a, now, Subcritical. Let's define these terms and then we'll explain the whole bomb thing. What's a subcritical? Um, that's when we've got less than one neutron causing another fission event. And critical? Uh, that's when we have exactly one neutron. One neutron per event. Per event. And then producing again another neutron. To produce, yeah. We'll illustrate this. Right another neutron. So it's just kind of sustaining itself there. Yeah, and supercritical. Supercritical is when uh, more than one neutron from each event causes more and more reactions. So if you have uh, a nuclear event occurring it, well, that was started by one neutron and it kicks out, say, three neutrons, then we're supercritical. And actually, um, when you have a nuclear power plant, everybody gets worried that somehow a nuclear power plant would blow up but they always have subcritical amounts of 
fissionable material. Right. So it cannot blow up. Now it could melt down, right. but it cannot blow up. Okay, so watch that. Now a bomb, on the other hand, of course, is where we They're shooting move. for supercritical. They're shooting for supercritical. So here's actually that picture we saw a minute ago. If I have a neutron that bombards a uranium-235 nucleus, it will split apart into two other elements. I think it's barium and something else. Something else. Actually, it's uh, barium and krypton. Barium and krypton. So it makes barium, and then this, let's say this is krypton. But then it kicks out three, three neutrons. more neutrons in the reaction. So at that stage, we're talking supercritical reaction. Because then if you've got another uranium-235 atom close by, it will then strike this nucleus, and he will make three. And he will make three. So it goes from like one, one to three to nine to 27. To 84. To whatever, 27. 7 times 3 is 21. 81, etc. But it happens in milli milliseconds or microseconds or whatever, and it can happen extremely quickly. So if you want to have it to be super critical, this is a picture of a super critical, then you can get it all going. Essentially, um, when you build a nuclear bomb, all you have to do is get the right amount of mass of uranium 235 together, bombard it with some neutrons, and it blows up. Now, how do they do that? Okay, there are actually two designs. There's the gun type method, and there is the um, implosion method. I forget what they call it. Yeah, implosion. Implosion. Assembly. There, you kind of gets right there. I can't even read. Uh -huh. So then, the gun type. Basically, you have um, the subcritical uranium-235, and then you've got some chemical explosive, and they have to bring them together at exactly the right time. And once they get together at exactly the right time, you now have a supercritical mass. And then, of and then it blows theory. up. Yep. And so you can either kind of draw them all together into the center, or you can get them to have sort of a gun design. And they both have been designed, and it gets just, and then this is what you see Kablooey. happening. Kablooey. Yeah. And so they've got some uh, uh, regular explosive TNT we talked about in the last podcast. That's what they use. And they can Good. get it all together. Yeah, I'm pretty cool. sure it's TNT. Yeah. Now, we should also make a note that those are, uh, what we just saw, this subcritical, supercritical, these are for fission bombs. Or actually, usually called an atomic bomb. Sadly to say, we figured out a better way to make a nuclear bomb. There's what we call a hydrogen bond. Bomb. I said bond, didn't I? You did. In a hydrogen bond, they use nuclear fusion. fusion. And we didn't really talk about this, but nuclear fusion has a lot, lot, lot more energy than nuclear fission. So remember that 14 million times? Mm -hmm. It's much worse than that. That's that a lot was of energy. Fusion, wasn't it? The 14 million? Oh, that was 14 that was million. Fusion, yeah. yeah, fission is probably only a million. That's yeah. where I think I knew that. Okay. But anyway, it's like 14 times stronger. And so they have nuclear fusion. And actually, to get fusion to work, you actually have to um, use an atomic bomb. To get it really hot. To get it hot enough to make it work. Right. Otherwise, it doesn't work. So they yeah. actually... They, We're talking like the sun temperatures here. Yeah. So <laughs> um, we could... Uh, yeah, do that. Interesting story. Let me tell you a story about the nuclear bomb. It's just intriguing. Uh, kind of a sad thing. Um, in the uh, 1940s, um, when uh, they were de designing the bomb with the Manhattan Project, a group of uh, scientists, and we were talking like the brightest scientists in the whole world. The world. Yeah, yeah, these guys were amazing. You know, I don't think Einstein was in the room, but guys like him. Um, I, I understand that the vast majority of people had won Nobel Prizes. I mean, like there were eight Nobel Prize people in a room of 14 people. So <laughs> amazingly brilliant guys. So they're in a room at, uh, I believe it's Caltech or Berkeley, some uh, university out in California, discussing the possibility of building this bomb. And um, they're discussing it. And then uh, uh, one young man who um, became famous later, but he was not a nuclear or not a uh, Nobel Prize winner, he got up and said, uh, wait a second. And he, he said, wait a second. He went up to the chalkboard. Can I have the chalk? He said, this is before they had computers and projectors and all that. He went to the chalk and he did some math on the board and he said, if we were to blow this up, couldn't it set up a chain reaction and blow up the world? Apple. So he got the chalk, he went up to the front of the room and he showed him the math. And everyone said, oh my gosh, it could happen. They all convened the day, the, the meeting for the day, said we need to go think about this because we don't want to blow up the world. <laughs> <laughs> they came back the next day, they calculated the probability, said it was one chance in a million, and they went ahead with the project. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they really believed there was a chance, one in a million, that if they blew up a nuclear bomb, it would blow up the world. Um, turns out they were wrong. That was good. But uh, it goes to show you these guys were very afraid of this, and they, they, they did the math, and I guess, you know, 
It still, of course, has killed lots of people. By the way, the atomic bomb that blew up uh, over in, in Japan, the only two that's ever been in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that was the atomic bomb. The fusion bombs um, are much, much worse, like we said. Um, they those tested never that. Never been used in warfare, have Never they? in warfare. They, they were tested on some islands in the Pacific. And you know what happened to those islands? They blew up. They blew up, and they don't exist anymore. They huh. totally the vaporized yeah. the island. Wow. It doesn't exist anymore. Wow. Since then, they've done underground tests because, of course, it creates they fallout. Tired of you know vaporizing islands and, stuff. and like you know causing cancer to animals and people and stuff too. Yeah. All right. Okay. You know what? My hat. Where'd my hat? Where's go? your hat? I don't Put know. your hat on. There's my hat. Well, guys. D on that. You and done. We're done. Sorry, to end on such a negative note, but we are physically done with podcasting. For you and in or whatever for everything. For yeah, me. this is it. Done, done. You've got all the all the stuff now. You need to review and study for the test, and we'll be doing that for quite some time. Have a wonderful life. Woo! Rock.